Good morning, everybody. That was a good time of worship, yeah? Yeah, isn't it great to be saved and to be able to really worship God? And, you know, it brings us onto a different level. Amen. Amen. I just want to pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your glory. I thank you, Father, that your glory is here right now, resting upon each one of us. I thank you, Father, for your angels that are here right now. And they are here to minister your word, Father God, to individuals as they open their hearts to your word, Lord. That will change lives, Father. That will bring light in the darkness, Father. And that people will go out not being the same. Yeah, I just believe that, Father God, because your word is what works. Not what I say, but what you say, Father, through me, Lord, that people will be changed for your glory. Amen. Amen. Um, Today I'm going to continue the series we've been doing on identity. Um, I'm sorry. I'm getting all these names in my head. Andy started it and Patience did one as well. Um, And then we had Graham last week. And I'm going to continue that theme of identity. And um, much of the theme, um, you know, about around identity is to do with our identity in Christ. And that is fantastic. And we need to know our identity in Christ. Um, But we've got to remember that we are three parts. We are spirit, soul, and body. We are spirit beings. And we have a soul. And we live in a body. And so when we're confessing the word and the, the things that the word says about our identity in Christ, who we are in him, You know, we are overcomers. You know, all those kind of scriptures that tell us who we are, that really build us up in the spirit. It does affect our soul, but it's mainly that we're building ourselves up in the spirit because that's what we need to do, is to always be building ourselves up in the spirit because the soul wants to take over and the spirit needs to be the one that's in charge. So it's good to confess those particular scriptures in order to get an identity in Christ as opposed to an identity from the world, from our souls. And you see, our souls will try to block the flow of the spirit. So it's really good to understand that we're not just spirit, but we also have a soul. We are spirit. We don't have a spirit, we are spirit, but we also have a soul which wants to take control. So what I'm going to do today is to talk about how even though we confess those things that we are in Christ, that we can actually have a little bit of um, resistance from what our souls have been brought up to believe and how our souls have been shaped by our upbringing and by by our thoughts and all those kinds of things in our lives. In, in fact, for many of us, it was our soul that has shaped our identity. If you've been lucky to be born in a Christian family, a really good Christian family, maybe you've you know, not had such a, a bad deal, but I wasn't brought up in a Christian family. I didn't get saved until I was 29, so my soul had control over my life for a long time. And so it was my soul that shaped my identity. And a number of years ago, I spent a a lot of time with the Lord. It was around about six weeks every day dealing with my identity. Not just what the Word says, but also what He was saying to me and what He was building me up with in a personal way. And it absolutely changed my life. And I came away from that really knowing who I was as a spirit being and as a person who was um, called by God to live this life. And if I, if I, like, it's not going to be easy to actually describe what it feels like to be, to really know your identity in Christ because it's more of a knowing than a feeling. But if I had any way I could describe it, I'd say it feels like being comfortable and at home in Him and in His kingdom. 
It's a, an amazing feeling to really know your identity. So I'm going to just talk about two particular areas that we struggle with in our soul that can actually um, hinder the, the flow of the Spirit. And I'm going to start that with just a scripture from Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, which says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I think that's a tremendous scripture to just show us the difference between spirit and soul and how that operates in our life. You see, living water is running water. And it's what we call ephemeral in that it needs refreshing every day. So that's what it's like living in the Spirit. We're living in a flow of the Spirit where we're dependent upon God every single day in a different way sometimes. It is that relationship. It's a bit like you know when he gave the manna in the wilderness and he said, don't take the manna from, you know, that's on the ground the next day because it will have gone rotten. So you must only eat it the same day except for the Sabbath when you can take two lots. Um, but that's what it's like living in the Spirit. We need today's manna, not something that's going to last necessarily all our lives. It's fresh every day because he wants us to come to him every single day freshly. And, and the, um, the cisterns that are, are, are being hewn is where the soul wants its needs met on a permanent basis. That's how we feel comfortable. Like, give me it and let it stay. Give me what I need, my comfort. Give me everything I need today and let that remain so I don't have to go back to God tomorrow. So I don't have to make that effort. So I don't have to go back to the Word. That's how we often feel. Why don't things stay the same? Why do I have to keep on getting fresh manner? And so we try to, you know, our soul tries to get us to, to, to get something permanent in our lives but actually, it's, it's, it's a broken system that we're trying to fill ourselves up with because it, it leaks. It doesn't, it doesn't last. And what the, one of, there are some soul needs that we have. They're legitimate needs. We need love and affection. We need value and significance. We need identity and purpose, and we need safety and security. And there are others, but those are just an example of the needs that we, meet, we, need, we need to meet in our soul. But you, know, you see, the soul is supposed to look to the spirit for those needs, not get them itself. And so what happens like when we're growing up, there are things that we need, and I'm going to talk about the need for acceptance because that's part of our, our identity. That's what builds our identity is acceptance. But we've tried to meet our need for acceptance within our souls and not by going to the Lord and, and getting acceptance from him and building our identity in him. When a baby is born, they say that the, baby, the baby's identity is the same as its mother. It can't quite decide whether it's its mother or itself. It's like the same thing. That's what I've been told. But I can see how that would be so. But as the baby begins to grow up as a, a child, it begins to learn to recognise itself through the responses of those around it. You know, and if it's told, oh, you're bold, you're bold, you're bold, it's going to grow up having an identity, I'm bold. You know, but if it's loved and cherished, then you know it grows up with a that the identity of being cherished. Now the Irish say bold for naughty. Bold, bold. bold. I can't do the Irish accent, sorry. <laughs> um, but in my culture, it's more like naughty. Bold wouldn't be so common in in England. Not that I've been living in England for a long while, but. Um, Anyway, when I was growing up, we had a lot of relatives um, and they would all congregate at my grandmother's house. There'd be uncles and aunts and cousins um, and sometimes there'd be like a dozen of the kids there at one time and it was great fun. 
But for some unknown reason, I kind of stood out. I don't know whether it was because I had a comical nature or because I was odd. I'm really not exactly sure. But I remember, you know, my aunts and uncles would kind of, you know, treat me like this. They'd say, bye, everyone, and Amanda. And it's like... What's, you know, is that because I'm really special or is it because there's something wrong with me? And I never quite figured it out. But it left me with that sort of identity that I'm a little bit odd. And then um, as I grew up more, I began to judge how much my parents loved me by the value of the Christmas presents that I would get as against my siblings. And that's how, you know, my thinking went and that's how I grew up and that's how I saw myself, that was my identity, that maybe I didn't get as good a gift as uh, my sisters. And then as a teen, there was a point in being about 13, I guess, when I said or did something, and I can't remember what it was, but two of my acquaintances, they weren't even proper friends, remarked about how good that was, or about how good I was. And I remember making almost a vow to myself saying, oh, I can actually make people like me by being a certain way. And that stuck with me, and I think for the rest of my adult life, until I got saved and began to understand more, that's what I was doing. I was being the person that other people would like instead of being myself. I don't know if this makes any sense to anybody here, but I think that's kind of what we do. We take our identity from others, how they respond to us, how they see us, how they treat us, how they speak to us, how they look at us. And that I, I believe that's very common. We make decisions as well from a need to be acceptable to others. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of embroiled with relationships. You know, we're, we're surrounded by people and, you know, family and friends, and we really need to be accepted by family and friends and, yeah, everybody um, in order to really feel that we have some kind of, a, you know, a, a legitimacy in this world. Another um, problem with our soul as we're growing up um, and even after we've grown up, is we have a need for safety and security. I think that's a very, very strong need, and you can see it throughout society where there is so much anxiety, and there's so much you know, going on in terms of you know, identity that says, I need to be safe, I need to feel safe, I'm not feeling safe. And that is so, it's, it's like a disease, um, and it's a very, very strong need. John 14, 27 says, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. And I'm saying, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. It's so easy to say it, isn't it? But actually living like that, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a battle and a journey to... Um, to, to be in peace at all times. And I, I have noticed the difference since I really got to grips with what my identity was in him. I have had a lot, lot more peace. Because again, we're drawing from the wrong source. And when we draw from the wrong source, anxiety is the result. If we're not going to God and we're not getting the security from him, we're not hearing him, we're not seeing his face, we're not understanding the way things work through his eyes, then we are going to have anxiety. If we're trying to survive in this life without a relationship with God, a regular daily relationship with God, we are going to have anxiety. And the people around us will cause us anxiety as well. I've got a couple of questions here that, you know, they, they apply to me as well. They applied to me when I was doing a, 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 going on a journey with, with God on learning about my identity. And I had to ask myself questions like this in order to get to the bottom of it. The first one, have I tried to keep myself safe and ended up making choices 
I never wanted to make. You know, that, that can set us on a course of destiny that we never wanted to have. You know, that takes our identity away from us when we're doing stuff that we don't really want to do. Um, a really silly thing, but, you know, to me it was very real. When I was about, well, I was, I was younger than 11 anyway, because I remember the, the, the school I was in. But I was in class, and it was just a, a, random, a random thing that the teacher said. And you'll often find in life that the, 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 the enemy just wants to bring fear through random phrases or random things that people say that he works through. And, I mean, you know, she didn't mean to... to be like that but this teacher said it was in the late 60s early 70s if the Russians drop a, an atom bomb on London it will reach as far as Manchester something like that you know and I'm like a, a little child and I'm thinking oh my god what if that happened you know and that lived with me for years and in my 20s I decided I wanted to get out of London and Manchester and as far away as possible. So once I got to learn to drive and, you know, to, to be independent, I applied for a job in Wick in Scotland. And if any of you know where Wick is, it's about the furthest place in Scotland you could ever get to. And I applied for a job there. And so I took my car and I started to drive. And when I got to Newcastle upon Tyne, I realised, from London, I realised I'd still got the same distance to go again. So I turned around and came back. But I was driven by this fear that, you know, the Russians were going to drop a bomb on London, you know? And you can say, well, that's ridiculous. But that's the way my mind was going. And that was the fear that was within me, you know? And you might not do anything as extreme as that, but I'm sure many of us have had fears that we've actually acted upon. And, you know, that's something that we need to eliminate by having our security in God. Another statement, have I processed my life through choices that others have made for me because I've been afraid of making the wrong decisions? You know, that, that's common too. Have I been afraid to admit I didn't agree with the opinions of others for fear of rejection or conflict? This is the way that we develop our identity, by making wrong choices. So if we've, if we've been shaped by others, we will be dependent on others to maintain our sense of acceptance and security. We become dependent on other people instead of dependent upon God. And I, I, I feel strongly today that the Lord has been speaking to me that, you know, there are people that... There's a lot of control going on in homes and families. And there's controllers and then there's people that are under control. And I just really believe the Lord would put his finger on that and just exhort one another to look at that. Because control is manipulation, is witchcraft, is a sin. And even being manipulated, being under that control and, and, you know, giving power to the controller by not doing anything about it, that is also a sin. And God just wants to put his finger on that. And if, you know, there's anybody that feels trapped in that maybe and needs to you know, open up about it. There are people here that you can come and open up about. But that's a serious thing that we live with. And often we don't recognise it or we don't do anything about it, again, because of fear. And, uh, you know, it affects our peace and our identity. There's another type of fear, and that fear is the fear of man. It's like awe. It's almost worship. Jeremiah 1.8 says, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. Amen. Have you ever looked at people's faces and read something in their faces that has affected your life, your security, your decisions? I have. Have we been moved by what those faces may be saying? Oftentimes we'd be wrong, but nevertheless, they can be very powerful. 
Have we wondered what that face, that look, that glance might mean for our own life, our value, our worth, our future? And these faces can come from family members, close family members, friends, work colleagues, neighbours, those in authority, even people we don't know, shop owners, and people on TV. Again, I remember as a young child, I would run away when the news came on because I was afraid of the seriousness of the faces of the newscasters. It put me in dread. And I hated it, so I would just run away. Have we lived with the angry face of a father? The worried expression of a mother? A look of disapproval or the flash of manipulation or control in the eyes of somebody where they manipulate you with their eyes? How about a sarcastic smile of a sibling? I remember one of those. <laughs> my mother bought my younger sister an ice cream. I was at home, but she didn't buy me one. Uh, she obviously had her reasons, but my little sister came up with the ice cream in her hand, opened the door in the bedroom where I was, went like that, <laughs> smiled and ran away. And I remember that so clearly. And it affected me because it made me think as though I wasn't loved as much as my sister. And then there's the tired and indifferent expression of shop floor staff. You ever get that? <laughs> I can understand it, but, you know, it just makes you feel depressed, you know, and it doesn't, doesn't do you any good. You know, so we need to see the face of our father, don't we? We need to say, see his smiling face that approves of us and gives us hope. And we won't see that unless we go and spend time with him. So another couple of statements that might, you know, gel with you. To survive in life, I need to become acceptable to my parents, my peers, and every person I become acquainted with. Who I am, sorry, who I am has to be in accordance with how I think people want me to be. I need to take care of my performance and certainly beware of failing. Though I desire honesty about myself, I should beware of it or people may reject me. Are we building our identities on the expectation of others and the dictates of the needs of our souls? Or are we building it, as Graham said last week, on the love of God and who he sees us as and who he's made us as. We're all unique. There is not another person that has ever lived or ever will live that can replace you. We're all totally unique and he's jealous for our identity. He doesn't want us to be anybody else. Just a few little things about how I found my identity, how it helped me. I've just got to grab my phone. Um, John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 4. Just want to read that. John 14, 1 to 4. Ah, where's the internet? Ah. Good thing about bringing a proper Bible, eh? Come on. Has anybody got a Bible I can borrow? Of course it is. Sorry. <laughs> I always forget that. Um, okay, John 14, 1 to 4. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house. Um, can we have the next one? Okay, thanks. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, in my father's house, now my translation I had, 
is the only translation I could find that didn't say many mansions. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thank you. Um, yeah. The translation I had said there's lots of room for everybody. You see, you know, so many of the translations say many mansions, but I don't really get that, you know, as, as a, a translation. Often when we're, we're looking at the Greek way of learning, we see a thing like a mountain, we see it as something you climb. But when you're looking at the Hebrew understanding of it, it's the function of it. So the mountain stands for authority. So a mansion is like a big house with lots of rooms in it. But from the Hebrew point of view, it's just a, a, you know, a, a big dwelling where there's lots of potential for everybody. So you know, that's the way I like to see it, that you know, he, he died and he rose again so that he could bring us into himself as a dwelling place. And so if you're born again today, you are in him and that is your home. He's in us too, but we need to see being in him, that's our dwelling place. He's made a way for us to dwell within him, within him as his home. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that just so homely feeling that now we can live in him and make that our home? Amen. And that's, you know, something that he has bought for us. And we just have to believe that and to, you know, go into him and just spend that time with him. Our identity is not about what we do. It's not about our career, our talents, etc. Those things come out of our identity when we spend that time with him and when we dwell in his home and when we become comfortable with him in that way. Then we begin to outwork that through what we do. But initially, it's not what we do. Our identity is who we are as a person. It's the deepest part of us the part that we suspect it is. But we're so used to the other part of us, we're so used to the bit about us that we call us, that we kind of withdraw from that deepest part of us that we suspect is really us. Do you, do you, do you feel that? That there's something inside of us that, you know, we almost don't want to show other people because they've become used to the part of us that they've seen all their lives. And they, you know, they, they don't, perhaps won't understand that deep part of us that we don't really show anybody else. And yet we know that's the real us. Because we've learned to perform for others and be acceptable, we withdraw from the real us. But we begin to recognize it through dwelling in the house of God regularly because he affirms us and he draws on that just as in the natural so in the spiritual when we get born again like a newborn baby he begins to shape us if we let him if we take the time with him he begins to shape us like the child's shaped by the people around him so God will shape us and he will affirm us and he will give us words of acceptance, words of peace. And if, you know, you've been born again for a long, long time and you, you never kind of knew that, you can go back to him and say, you know, baby me like as if I was a newborn Christian. Baby me again and tell me the things about me that you so longed to tell me. There's no substitute for intimacy. No substitute at all. That is the beginning of everything with God, is that intimacy. And finding inheritance words, that is words in the Bible that you really feel are personalised to you. Have you ever heard somebody standing up here and giving a verse and you're going, oh, that's my verse? 
You know, I, I find that often when there's verses that God has given to me personally, it's almost like, that's mine. What are you giving that verse for? That's mine. I have verses like Hosea chapter 2. I will allure her or attract her and bring her into the wilderness, speak comfort to her and give her her vineyards from there and the valley of trouble as a door of hope. And then there's other ones like Jeremiah 1 and I have drawn you. I can't remember that one. I'll move on. But I have all those beautiful scriptures that really speak to me and that's I'm sure you have but if you haven't you need to you know let God speak to you those what we call inheritance word words and we don't you know when we're going to just you know have a time with God it's not all about studying the word it's good to get familiar with the word but we need to see him face to face as well where he can totally personalize what he has to say to us and it's not always something that comes out of the word sometimes it's different and you won't find it in the word we need to cultivate that kind of face to face fellowship with him that Moses had you know, face to face as a man speaks to a friend. We can learn to hear his voice in our hearts as we dwell with him on a regular basis. And the, I think the most fantastic thing is about you go and you encounter him in the spirit and you spend that time with him and then you see that outworked in the natural. You see that outworked in your life. You know, you actually, you know, have moments where you, you think to yourself, Wow, you know, that's what God said to me. That's how it was when I was with him the other day. You know, you see that whole thing outworked. Just a few things that I, I, I got out of the time I spent working on my identity. I began to walk in who I was rather than what others expected of me. I should change that, the tense of that. I began to walk in who I am rather than what others expected of me. And that was just so freeing. I got excited, I still get excited, about not trying to control outcomes, but rather watching him work it out for me. Just dropping everything and just saying, Lord, I'll watch you. You know, especially when it comes to relationships, when somebody's, you know, wanting things of you or wanting you to do stuff. And, you know, you just say, right, okay, Lord, I'm just going to drop everything, all the expectations, all the strife of, you know, wanting to do it my way. I'm just going to see how you work it out. And it's amazing how he works it out when we trust in him instead of trying to control it all ourselves. I hear little phrases all day long of love and affirmation and direction. I never had that a long time ago, but I have that all the time now. I have less need to be in competition and no longer need to fight to be noticed. That was a big one. <sighs> what a battle. And this one, like, do you ever think you're weird? I often think I'm weird. And that is because God has made me a certain way that he hasn't made everybody else. Okay, so now I'm more comfortable with the things about me that others might have thought are weird. Because I now know these things are who I am. And instead of with sort of trying to you know, stop being weird, I'm actually cultivating it. So if you think I'm weird, you're going to think even, even more. Because <laughs> I'm cultivating it now. Because that's how God has made me. Peculiar. Yeah, maybe that's a better word. But we've all got something weird or peculiar within us that is totally unique. And instead of running from it, because it's not like everybody else, you know, we like to conform, don't we? We don't want to be different in any way. But we need to be different because that's his identity for us. He wants us to be who we are, who he has made us to be, not, not who he's made the next person. Another soul need is significance. We don't know who we are. We are so much greater than we think. And God wants us to have significance in this world. He wants us to know who we are and to bear the mark of Almighty God. 
Because we do. But he wants us to show that. He wants us to live that out. That we are children of the almighty God. He stooped down to make us great. He wants us to live a life of greatness in him. We have unhindered, unlimited access to the heavenly realms. Now, through the veil. That gives us significance. Because when we go through the veil and meet him face to face, as I said, that's when our life begins to be outworked from the heavenlies to the earth. He has a purpose and a destiny beyond what we could think of or imagine. And he wants to reveal those things to us. But we need to get into that secret place with him. And it doesn't have to be a field or a barn, as Graham says, because this real secret place is within us. So it's wherever we can be. So I'm going to finish now. And as I said, these things can't be explained as much as it just being a knowing within you. And it's to just recognise that knowing and to see where you're trying to get acceptance in the wrong places and trying to get security in the wrong places and begin to put your trust in acceptance and security in him. So that you can, we can all be the person God made us to be and bring his glory upon the earth. Last year I brought a prophetic word to her. Uh, uh, a youth meeting that my son was running and I'm going to I'm going to read it again now God is jealous we often are following a path in life that was not destined, destined for us shaped by culture nurture and trauma he is jealous for us the real us He's jealous when we pursue someone else's destiny. We cover others' lives as well as their goods. But we can also be guilty of not fulfilling our own destiny through fear, rebellion or pacifism. He's jealous for the real me and the real you. And we need to be separated from all that prevents us and wars against us to who we really are. The striving, the searching, the rising up of the soul to be seen, the fighting within, the siding of the darkness, the self-centeredness and the assassination of others in order to promote ourselves. We need to cultivate intimacy with the Father daily to find ourselves. And I believe God wants to give us new wine today. And new wine is not the, not the same and just more of what you've already had. New wine is new wine. Something different. Something fresh. Something unique. That's what I believe he wants to give today. And I want us to dig deep into our spirits to find the real us and to find him. He lives within us. The kingdom of God is within us. And there is a door within us that leads to the kingdom of heaven as well. And he's knocking at that door and he's saying, I want to come in. And as we begin to worship, I want to suggest that you don't stand to worship until you've looked inside of yourself to find an affirmation from God of who the real you is and a determination that you're going to develop and cultivate that real you in him. Do you think we can do that? So, Father, I just commit each one to you, Lord. And I know, Father, that because you have said you would, you will bring affirmation to each heart that is open to hear you, Father. I thank you, Jesus, that you want to knock on the door of our hearts, not just when we get saved, but every single day. You want us to open the door of our hearts to you and to let you in so that we can fellowship with you face to face. I thank you for that, Father. And I just ask that you would do that now for each one that opens that door, that you would bring words of affirmation, words of acceptance, of security, of intimacy, Father, 
because you're a real God. You're a real God. And I just know that you're going to show your face to those here this morning. Whoever will hear, whoever will see. Thank you, Father. Amen.